Tonight on Women, we're going to be discussing women as a political force. Our guests are Sissy Farenthold, president of the National Women's Political Caucus and former state legislator for Texas. Also with us is Jill Ruckelhaus, special assistant to the counselor to the president and wife of the acting FBI director, William Ruckelshaus. Well, you're both of you very much in the forefront of the political arena today. What do you think from a realistic point of view? Do you think we'll ever see a woman president in our lifetime? I think so, assuming we all live long enough. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's a real possibility. I think now uh, there was a poll recently that showed over 70 percent of the population could envision themselves voting for a woman. Really? That's For president if she embodied the spirit and the goals of the country at that time. And uh, I think that the fact that we elected 20 percent more women to state legislatures last November indicates that people are beginning to think more and more of women as being capable of taking a leadership role in politics. That's extremely encouraging. Do you have a similar viewpoint? Well, Susan? I take a, a put another emphasis on it. Uh, what I'm anxious to see is greater participation in the electoral process of women on the state, local level, and national level. And then out of that, we'll have that reservoir of skill and talent and experience. We don't have it now. I mean, when you think that today we do not have one U.S. senator that's a woman, we do not have one woman that is a governor, and ordinarily it's from this area that your national tickets are, are generally develop. So I think the emphasis needs to be put on, on uh, electing women in other offices. Now, has this remained constant in Congress? The, there was a time, wasn't there, when there were four um, women congressmen, albeit the widows of um, congressmen who died whilst they were serving their terms. Has this remained pretty constant over the no, last No, well, there are years? 15 women in the House of Representatives, isn't that That's right, right, Jill? But uh, there is no woman senator. Now, that is an increase, I think, what, last time, 11, but we're just playing around with, with just such small number when you think of the percentage of women in this country and the size of the, of the U.S. Congress. It's, it's true that of all the elective and appointed government jobs in the country, only 3 percent are held by women. So you can see we're a long way from being adequately represented. And over 50 years of the enfranchisement. Well, you, Sissy, were extremely successful at the last election. You were not only a delegate, but you were also runner-up in the vice presidential campaign to Senator Eagleton. How, what do you attribute this to? Well, I, I attribute that in, in great part to the uh, Women's Political Caucus. Uh, my, my candidacy down there uh, was spearheaded uh, by the Women's Caucus. It picked up support uh, from, from other segments of the delegation, but it was principally a, a woman spearheaded thing. And of course, uh, as far as I was concerned, its principal point was uh, uh, to uh, advocate an open convention in the selection of the vice presidency. And I think in the future we'll see something along that line develop. How close was it actually? Do you remember the vote? No, all I remember was I had 420 votes and... Uh, uh, I think 600 was the winning total. And, and uh, we were, the, it looked as if there was a chance to uh, go to a second ballot and then some of the votes were pulled down and so on. But aside from that, and also what it did was um, it broke a barrier. And unless those barriers are broken, uh, people will never get past that point of sort of thinking in stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I felt the same way about the governor's race in Texas. Uh, I mean, you get past that point of, of the obstacle being that you're a woman and, and, and look to other factors involved. Will you go on, do you think, and, and run again? I never know. I think that uh, I, I care a great deal for public life and the public sector, uh, but uh, I just don't know. I've never been able to program my political life. and. I really am not motivated unless I feel I have a function, and so I have to remain sort of vague at this point. Right. Jill, they say that the closer to the seat of power you are, the more power rubs off. How many women presidential advisors are there right now? Well, there is only one counselor to the president, and for the first time in the history of the country, it's a woman. Uh -huh. uh, she has a variety of responsibilities. One of them is women's programs, which is uh, the area that I'm in charge of. And this is Anne Armstrong. Anne Armstrong, right? that's right. And, and now you're in charge of this, are you? Of the, of the women's programs part of her office. She has a variety of functions, including the uh, cost of living council and domestic council and 
and a great many other things. But for the first time, there is an office in the White House that's in charge of women's programs, liaisons with other women's groups. And How long has this been in existence? And do you, do you think that it is in any way as a result of the women's movement Absolutely pressure lobbying again from the political caucus, perhaps? Sure it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's only been in existence since my appointment, which was the beginning of February. And it is, an, it's a reflection of the interest in society in having the numbers of women participating in uh, the middle management and top policy making positions in government more uh, adequately represented. At the present moment, 72% of all the women working for federal government are in what are defined as clerical positions. Mm -hmm. Well, what has the response on the part of the federal government been so far? Well, it's, you know, it's been very good in the last four years. Uh, I think historically, when, when we look back and see at what point the federal government began looking at itself and saying, uh, we've got to do something very self-consciously about putting more women into these top-level positions, they can talk about the early years in the 1970s. Uh, there is now a woman on the Council of Economic Advisors for the first time. There is now a woman head of the Atomic Energy Commission. There are two women chairing the federal regulatory agencies for the first time. And this is a reflection of the pressure of society to include more women in these policy-making positions. How does your husband feel about your work? Does this pose any kind of conflict, any kind of problems no, within the family all. situation? Not at all. Uh, it, no more so than the conflict that any woman who works. I work part-time and not full-time, so there's that conflict. But in terms of us both working for the federal government, no, we're both working for causes that we believe in, and he's very supportive of everything that I'm. That's I've. great. How about you, Sissy? My husband has been incredibly uh, reasonable about the thing. And in the beginning, uh, he encouraged me to run for the legislature. I've always said that there'll never be any race more difficult than my first race. Uh, in 1968, when I ran for the legislature, I wasn't a token, I was a joke. <laughs> and uh, he encouraged me. Uh, without question, uh, as I became more immersed in my work, uh, it became more difficult. Uh, but again, uh, when I had to make the decision in 72 about where I was going, uh, he encouraged me to run for the governor's uh, position, uh, something I really appreciated because uh, many people flinched at the idea in the beginning. Uh, he didn't, though. And uh, just the other evening I was talking to him because uh, right now I don't know really where I'm going personally but uh, as Jill and I are both involved in the caucus have been ERA and such things uh, it takes me away a great part of the time and uh, he was saying that uh, I couldn't stop now so I guess you'd say that's exceedingly reasonable. ERA being the equal rights. Yeah. Right. Do, you, do you think there's any particular type of woman that, that gets into politics? Are there any underlying similarities or can't you generalize? Do you find I, uh, no. Uh, of course, you know, the whole thing, I say, uh, I came to the women's movement through politics. Uh, the women's movement wasn't even, uh, wasn't even a term in Texas in 1968. Uh, I went into politics because I've always been interested in it. I knew the obstacles, but I felt once if I was elected, those obstacles of being a woman in one thing would, would, uh, would go away. They did not, but that's, that's another... Uh, another subject. Uh, I found once I got to? there though that there were areas of vast neglect that what we generally call women's issues. So uh, and, and now in the Texas legislature instead of being one woman as it was the two terms I served, there's six. And uh, happily there are different types, uh, different characteristics, different backgrounds, different training, different races and so I don't uh, think there's any occasion. I know there's a stereotype. Yes, and you two, incidentally, are both very different from the traditional stereotype. You're both very quietly spoken and low-key, at least, you know, on cursory acquaintanceship. This is the way you, you come over. Do you feel this has worked to your advantage or to your disadvantage? Well, I think it's <laughs> a, that, I think that is my approach, and I prefer um, communication instead of confrontation. Other women in politics have found that the, that the confrontation technique has been successful in their point of view. And now, I think it's your own temperament. I mean, I don't it's think your, you it's know, it's your own style. I constantly urge women to run for office and get involved and not be turned off by the styles of other women they've seen no. active if it didn't appeal to them because, good heavens, look at the number of, of men who have such Different a variety types. of approaches. Right. Is there any one particular female politician whom you think is particularly effective, whose, whose style appeals to you? Specifically? 
Oh, I think of uh, uh, vast numbers. Uh, for example, I'm a great admirer of Bella Absa. Mm -hmm. I've often thought of it, and I don't think I could get seven votes in her district. I wouldn't be heard, for one thing. <laughs> and uh, she's a, a, a person of tremendous ability, I think, and uh, I, I just have a great deal of respect for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, I don't think we have much in common, you know, to just see the two of us together. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't think Bella would get many votes in Texas. <laughs> well, <laughs> she might. She came off awfully strong in Commerce, Texas, believe it or not, a couple of months ago she was down there. But that's just one person. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are others that uh, Shirley Chisholm I, I admire a great deal. Okay. Bella I have worked more with than Nora. Mm -hmm. I've heard it said, and I'm in no way connecting this thought with Bella Absic or, or any specific person, but I've heard it said very often that when women get in a position of political power, they very often sell out to other women. In other words, they, they don't use as many women as they perhaps might on their staff, and they don't campaign as actively for, for women's causes. Do you think there's any truth to this? And if so, can you explain the psychological phenomena? I would, may I sure. say something, Jill? Because I think that's one of those fallacies, really. You do. Uh, but let me say again from my own experience, uh, one of those uh, myths that uh, uh, could only be punctured by being challenged is this thing of women not working for other women. And uh, I've seen a change from 1968 when I first ran to 72 when I ran, when a greater and greater numbers of women were participating and worked their hearts out. And I hope that I've been able to reciprocate in kind. So uh, to me, that's, uh, I, I think it's one of those myths that have sort of developed. Mm -hmm. I think it may have been true maybe five or six or seven years ago that, uh, that uh, women were not thinking about themselves as role models and they weren't thinking about the lack of other women in the system. Uh, I've talked, I know, with uh, Lenore Romney who ran for the Senate in 1970. She said one of her real problems was getting other women to accept her as a candidate. Uh, this fall, she was also campaigning, and she said she felt that the whole uh, acceptance of a woman in politics had come around a in two years. Tremendous change in a way she I saw since imagine. '68, mm -hmm. and I see it now when I campaign. And, and women say, "Well, wait till '76." I mean, there's a real fervor. The, the five new Congresswomen, I think, that were elected in November were Barbara Jordan from Texas, and uh, Yvonne Brathway from California, and Marjorie Hole from Maryland, and Liz Holzman from New York, and. and uh, Patch Roder from Colorado, or all women who are acutely conscious of, the, of their role as women mm -hmm. in the Congress and what they mean to other women who aspire to public office. And uh, they feel very responsible for that national constituency they have. That yeah, I think that there was a tremendous sense of, and I know from my own experience, of isolation in the past that I don't think women office holders now have when you name the five. I mean, there's, there's an uh, awareness. And with that isolation, I know I had uh, my own experience uh, when I went to the Texas legislature and I wanted to introduce legislation for a state human relations commission that would prohibit discrimination uh, based upon uh, race or, or religion or um, ethnic background. And the professor that was drafting the legislation wanted to add sex. And I said, no. Let's concern ourselves with the minorities. He insisted that that be put in. Well, one term later and two years later, when I reintroduced that legislation in the Texas legislature, I had no qualms whatsoever about adding sects, prohibiting uh, discrimination based upon sex, simply because of what I had learned that I was not aware of. Literally, well, do you I think the sexual conflict is greater in politics than perhaps in other institutions? No, I or think it's all. More aware no, you know, for example, I say down in Texas that I'll take my chances with the electorate rather than practice law as a woman in that state. Really? Yeah, I mean, that, that's just happened. So. Uh, so I think there are those problems in all the institutions and in all the institutions that are powerful. Uh, we have had this dichotomy in this country, you know, from finance, economics, uh, all the professions, technology, uh, as I say, with its deadliest uh, offspring of modern warfare, uh, and politics, where the power has, has all been masculine dominated, and principally white male domination. And uh, we have served as handmaidens. Uh, you know, 90%, for example, of uh, uh, dietitians, librarians, uh, elementary uh, school teachers, and nurses are women.
Mm -hmm. You know, those have been the roles assigned. Women are also the political backbone of the country, aren't they? But in a, in a volunteer situation, in a volunteer capacity as uh, poll watchers. And so you know, as support. I often said, had I waited on uh, the Democratic uh, County Party in my home county of New Oasis uh, uh, to run for office, I'd still be answering telephones. Uh, so you find it in that institution as well as... Uh, yeah. But that's a, a that's a role I think that the caucus, uh, the National Women's Political Caucus, uh, is playing so well now, and it's encouraging women who have gained a vast experience in politics through volunteerism and you know taking the polls and addressing envelopes and uh, manning headquarters, and who know how the process works, and who've also gained the experience of working in their communities, and really know what the social needs are, to think of themselves in a new way, not as supporting casts, but as potential candidates who have a a terrific contribution to me. When was the caucus set up and how long has it been going? Well, it was organized in June of 1971, so it'll be two years old this coming June. And, uh, I think it's reflective of really the need it has fulfilled, that it, it has developed as, as it has. And I really think one, it was before I was involved, because I was down running for office or something, um, was its insistence of, that it was time for a woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And I think people now are generally aware of that. I wanted to mention one thing before it passed, and as I said, I, I have participated in the electoral process, which is what I, I, I like a great deal. And I haven't had a textbook to do it with. And uh, I think there are three terms that come to my mind that I think uh, uh, are prerequisites, and they're things that I've lived, but I think you can generalize from them. First is an awareness, and I think you were speaking of that, Jill. There's a greater awareness, and you have mm -hmm. to have the awareness before you do anything. And then you have to have an assertiveness, and I think what you're speaking of, the role of the caucus in getting women into moving on past the, the uh, uh, so much of the work they've done uh, has called for a new assertiveness. And then I think there comes time for what I call audacity. And it's the audacity that breaks down the barriers and uh, uh, develops things for the future. Do you think the caucus has taken the place of the League of Women Voters? There is a distinction. <laughs> yes, I know. But the League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. Uh -huh. The fact that Jill and I are sitting here, I think, <laughs> is reflective of one of the characteristics of the caucus, and that is that it is multi-partisan. Mm. I was going to ask you a question along those lines. Do you, do you ever find that the Republican versus Democrat contest takes place within the caucus inadvertently and perhaps obscures the greater goals in any way? Uh, well, yes, we have preliminary skirmishes all the time and uh, there's, a, there's a difference of opinion over whether the administration is going properly or what legislation you should be pushing for and uh, what kind of a public stance to take against uh, uh, perhaps legislation has been passed or hasn't been passed. Uh, in the in the long run, we do get back to the to the aims of the caucus, and uh, everyone has has been able to bring themselves together. We survived a, a presidential campaign and remained intact and had a very successful and a convention, convention. <laughs> and a in, convention in Houston in uh, in February. And so. this is so important because I think that if it if it is successful, it is so much more effective. And nonpartisan, well, what is because the there's only one place, and that's I mean, if you're involved, if you intend to be involved, if you intend to be heard in politics, there's only one place to be, and that's in the political arena. What do you see as it as as the caucus's main objective, main goal? What what would you like to see it accomplish the most? Well, we were talking coming out here about what is overdue business, isn't that right, Jill? Mm -hmm. That's the Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah, now, one. What, what do you think of the, first of all, the amount of publicity the Equal Rights Amendment has been given in the newspapers? Do you think it's been given sufficient coverage? I think, it, I think uh, if I may say this without sounding paranoid, <laughs> I think the coverage has been uh, skewed so that they, the media has picked up the fact that there's conflict and that the amendment isn't being passed as quickly as, in their eyes, it, they had expected to see it passed. When, in fact, I think the discussion that's going on now is probably a quite healthy thing. It took the National Congress 50 years to answer all their questions, and I'm not surprised that state legislatures are raising questions themselves and trying to get to the bottom of what the full legal implication is. Uh, Thirty states have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment within the first year. Historically, over two-thirds of all the amendments to our Constitution have taken over two years to be ratified by the state. So 
I don't think we're in all the heavy weather that the media might uh, might propose. So you're very optimistic. Quite. We have six more years future. to get eight more states. And we have a lot of work to do. And I, as I said, we were talking about it. I think when you shift from the congressional level to the state legislature's level, it's a different operation. Uh, I know from my own experience in the Texas House, it wouldn't carry any weight for a group to come down and say, uh, we have the support of 50 national uh, organizations. It, it just uh, doesn't carry any weight to speak of. But I think that uh, there's going to have to be a public education, for one thing, um, uh, on the part of women directed toward other women. And I think in some areas this has been neglected. I think we need a broader base. And one of the things that has really distressed me as I've traveled over the country is where I've found the active opposition of the state AFL-CIOs to the Equal Rights Amendment. Are you state. talking about female opposition or no, I'm general talking about opposition? The, uh, general opposition so a lot of the of state AFL-CIOs in uh, states such as uh, Ohio and Illinois, Washington and Maine, to just name a few. And as I put it, uh, I'm puzzled that the spokesman for the working man has turned his back on working men. But a lot of women themselves have, have second thoughts about it, don't they? They feel This is where I say the area of public education mm -hmm. comes in. You don't feel that there's any justification to the argument that rather than giving extra sort of uh, protection, it might take away the protection which is already here and the privileges which already exist under the I don't world. think those things can really stand much analysis, very frankly. Do you, Jill? No, I sure don't. I think there's, li there's a large amount of misinformation that's been put put out uh, either intentionally or uh, or has been believed by people who believe the source that it came from. Uh, no one stands to lose any enforceable right that they now enjoy under the Equal Rights Amendment. Surely 53 percent of the population should not have to go to court to find equality of the protection of the law, which we, which we now have to, have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what all this amendment proposes is uh, the extension of the equal protection of the constitutional Constitution and uh, federal law and state law to men and women. Regardless it's simply of their just males to bring women females. within the confines of the Constitution. Uh, it's a, it's rather simple and it doesn't carry all the dire uh, possibilities that are envisioned for it. As a matter of fact, the arguments that are used against the ERA are by and large the same ones that were used against the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. And, uh, and there were some of the, the arguments used down in Texas. Uh, uh, against women serving on juries. You know, it always rankled me in that state that uh, I was able to practice law before I could serve on a jury. Well, why are we using the same arguments today that we were using 50 years ago? Isn't this a pretty sad reflection? I think it is, mm -hmm. but I think it's a reflection of the fact that we really didn't move much and that women are to blame as well as men past the 19th Amendment. We sort of let that impetus die after the amendment was passed. And Something uh, happened after that terrific thrust of the 19th Amendment. As I've often said, I don't know what it was because I wasn't around, but by the time I came around, I think a bill of goods had been sold that politics wasn't feminine. At least this was the <laughs> case where I'm from. And, you know, it was simply something to stay away from. They say that um, women sometimes bring into politics with them the traditional characteristics or, or stereotypes that are associated with women, you know, such as uh, the nurturant woman, the mediator, the, the passive woman, and all this. Do you think, if there is any, any vestige of truth in, in it, um, do you think this makes women more liberal, regardless of their political affiliations, perhaps, than, than, than men? Maybe it makes them more humanist, and that's it makes them more liberal. I think a woman's training uh, culturally now is is more dealing with individual needs, the needs of her family, the needs of her community. There's a superb article in the Princeton Quarterly for last time called uh, Bringing uh, Feminine Characteristics into the Power Structure, and it speaks of that. Uh, perhaps that will come about, I don't know. And again, you know, I don't like to overemphasize this because I don't want to attribute all public virtue to women. Well, what's your personal feeling on the subject? 
I think that there's, a, 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 to an extent, a different viewpoint. I think particularly when women no longer feel they have to be defensive. And I think what you were speaking of about the times in the past, or what I was speaking of the times when women were isolated, and you had to prove yourself in the man's world, in the political world, and perhaps you didn't, you weren't aware of your sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that time is generally past. To backtrack a little bit, do you think there's anything in the Equal Rights Amendment that will prohibit job discrimination anyway? Well, it, it certainly says, what the Equal Rights Amendment says is equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any states on account of sex. And that means there cannot be any distinction but we, by sex in federal or state statutes. But we already have a similar statute right now on the books, don't we? We have Title as far seven as job of, discrimination of Title concerned. Seven of the Civil Rights. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, the ERA would be broader for one thing. It would cover... Uh, Listen, we've got area. two minutes left. <laughs> I'd like you to speculate, if you would, on a world that was 50-50, male and female, as far as political um, orientation was concerned, a totally egalitarian structure. What do you think this would be like? I think it would be probably more responsive to human needs. Uh, I think women's whole characteristic is uh, to deal with individuals. Uh, and it's, it's been our culture, it's been our history, and I have a feeling it may be our biological destiny to be concerned with the, the children we raise, the communities we live in. And perhaps we'd, we'd find ourselves less concerned about territorial imperatives and more interested in, uh, in humans. So Other directed, as I said before, earlier though, I don't want to attribute all virtue to women office holders, but I do think that uh, perhaps areas that have been so sorely neglected in our exploitive society uh, would be given some attention and as Jill said these are the areas we're going to have to move into to survive not just in this country but on this planet. Susie Farenthold, Jill Rucklesthouse, thank you both very much for joining it's us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us also. Good night from Woman.